Hey, it's Andrew Claven with this week's interview, which was with my friend Christopher Rufo, who has a new book, excellent new book, called America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. You know, I was talking this week to some young people at what's called the Patriot Academy. Uh, Jeremy Boring is friends with them, and so he asked me to give a little speech to them, and I was talking about the power of being polite, which I know sounds like a minor thing, but I recently read this article in American Mind about artificial intelligence where the author said, people think artificial intelligence is woke. It's programmed to be woke. So for instance, they've asked ChatGPT to write a, a poem in praise of Joe Biden, and it will, but they ask it to write a poem in praise of Donald Trump, and it doesn't. And he says, no, it's not woke. It's just trained to reject hate speech. And when it goes online and gathers up all this information, it finds more hate speech on the right than on the left. And I think this is true. The left will do incredibly racist things, like they will lower the standards of math teaching because they don't think black people can learn math. That's So they think that's that'll make them more equal, which is incredibly racist, but they don't use racial slurs. Where on the right, we are more willing to tolerate rudeness and genuine bad manners and language by guys like Nick Fuentes and his hatefulness about Jews and Andrew Tate and the way he talks about women. And we tolerate that. And there's a reason for it. We are so shut down by the culture that tells us everything we say is racist, everything we say is sexist, whatever we say when we're just speaking the truth, we're phobic, we're homophobic, we're Islamophobic, we're all kinds of phobic, that it sounds like strength to push back against them by saying things that are actually racist and sexist. It sounds like we're being courageous by standing up to that censorship. But in fact, that kind of behavior is a sign of fear. It's a sign, it's what animals do when they make themselves big or they pound on their chest or they make noise, trying to keep predators away because they're afraid of what will happen when the predators attack. Now, I believe that if you walk in the truth, that you've got magical, supernatural powers backing you up and you don't have to be afraid of anybody. And I think a person who is polite but will not be moved is the kind of warrior we need. And this is one of the reasons that I actually really, really like Chris Rufo. I think he does. He has been doing such a bang-up job, and I've never seen him lose his cool. I've never seen him be rude. And yet, he has made more... I'll just read you some of the praise on the back of his book. And these are from people... Uh, you know, Tucker Carlson says Christopher Rufo is, in fact, one of the most effective journalists and filmmakers in the country. That is absolutely true. Dr. Uh, Peterson, Jordan Peterson, calls him an international class troublemaker. Also true. Ben Shapiro, whom you may have heard of, calls him one of the most important journalists in the country. Uh, and The Atlantic Magazine calls him one of the most gifted conservative polemicists of his generation. Chris, it is great to see you again. It's been a while. It's good to be with you. And I, I'm really enjoying the book. Um, well, before we talk about the book, it's called America's Cultural Revolution. What are you doing now? What, what other projects are you working on? Well, I mean, you know, this is it. And, 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 and the labor of writing a book and then <laughs> and launching a book out into the world is a huge endeavor. And so um, I, I'm, I'm at this kind of crossroads and not sure what I want to do exactly next, but I'm, I'm in the midst of a few projects um, maybe putting together a new book. I'm working on policy with uh, Governor DeSantis's team in Florida. Uh, we're, we, we've retaken a public university in Florida. We're now governing that institution. And so um, what I'm trying to do, um, and, and I think I'll be doing in the next year, is taking a lot of the ideas and concepts that I develop in the book and trying to actually implement them in the real world. That, to me, is the most exciting thing to do. It's just you know, getting out of the, the life of the mind and, and, and into the, uh, the life of human action. Uh, that's that's something that I think is quite quite fun and quite compelling to me right now. Yeah, I mean, you did. It was wonderful to watch you take that back that university, and I've been kind of. I'm not appalled at this point. I'm not surprised by any of this stuff. But the way they have characterized the reforming of the university, making it sound like you're being racist and, you know, that you're banning books and all this stuff. But there's been none of that, really, A. And B, I, I, I wanted to ask if you are expanding those efforts if DeSantis is expanding those efforts throughout the state, and are you going to be part of that, do you think? Yeah, there, there's there's more reforms to come. Uh, this year was a huge year for university reform. Uh, I worked with the governor to abolish DEI de departments in every public university in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. That's a big accomplishment. There's conservative research centers that are cultivating the next generation of more conservative-leaning uh, scholars in now three of the flagship state institutions. And of course, at New College, where I'm a trustee, uh, you know, we're, we're overhauling the university top to bottom. We uh, fired the leadership. We brought in new leaders. We have a new core curriculum that's in development. 
We've recruited the largest incoming class in the college's history. So people now want to attend the mm, new college of wow. Florida. That's great. And I think what we're going to do and we'll announce in the coming months is some incredible scholars uh, from around the country who are sick of uh, uh, being uh, kind of pummeled and pushed around and silenced and shamed. Um, you know, we're creating an, an open environment, a new college, supporting people who are uh, from a wide variety of disciplines, of perspectives, but who share a classical liberal arts mission. And that's the that's really the catchword that, that we're focused on is reviving the classical liberal arts, uh, which is not the same thing as DEI uh, or, or, you know, gender studies and, and critical race theory. Now, we're trying to actually go back to a classical model that's informed and sustained the West for, you know, 2000 plus years. And, and bring it a, a new home on the beach in Sarasota, Florida. That's great. That is great. So the book is called America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. And it's about what's usually called the long march through the institutions. Can you describe to people what that is? Yeah, in the late 1960s, left-wing radicals that were organized as the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, the Weather Underground, the Communist Party USA, uh, and, other, and other groups, believed that they could foment uh, an armed revolution against the American government and found a new, you know, Marxist utopia uh, beyond the constraints of capitalism and the Constitution and class uh, and other uh, uh, institutions they viewed as inhibitions. Uh, this crashed and burned. You have Richard Nixon elected in 68. You have Nixon elected with 49 state landslide in 72. And so by 1972, the Marxist uh, groups were scattered. They were uh, uh, dismembered. They had been, you know, uh, disrupted by uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, and they were seeking a new strategy. They said, "Well, how do we get these ideas? Our ideas are right. Uh, it's not that our ideas are wrong, or we should reconsider them. Uh, merely how we've implemented them through armed revolution has not worked. So, how do how, what do we do now?" And so they had a, a strategy, actually, out of, at the time, out of desperation, out of their own limitations. They said, "Well, we're going to burrow into the existing institutions." We'll bring the ideology in from the outside. We'll use these chokeholds and these, and these uh, gatekeeping mechanisms within established institutions. And once we gain power there, we solidify our power, then we'll impose our ideology on everyone else uh, through, through this institutional politics. And you know, lo, lo and behold, decade after decade after decade, they had the patience, the self-discipline, the strength, and the, and the political savvy to actually make this happen to the point where um, most Americans in that summer of 2020, they saw all of the institutions uh, uh, kind of hook, line, and sinker, following the BLM line, supporting critical race theory, kowtowing to the gender activists. Um, and and they, most Americans said, well, how did this happen? Well, how did all of a sudden our institutions seem to be captured all at once? Uh, the answer is that uh, it didn't happen all at once. It wasn't by accident, but it was part of this uh, uh, many decades in the making and all part of this plan. Now, this is something that has always mystified me. And this is one of the best histories of this I've ever read. I'm not sure I've read anything as clear as this. One of the things that's always mystified me is you can say something like this, but it's like a generational plan. You know, it's like taking a spaceship to another star. You have to actually have new generations of people coming in. What was the mechanism that allowed them to do this? Why were they so able to take over these institutions? Were the institutions themselves rotten inside? I think, I think a, couple, a couple key reasons. One is that they, they selected their targets and the sequence of their targets quite brilliantly. They began, of course, with the universities. Uh, the 60s radical you know, student movement was their initial base of support. They found very sympathetic environment within the universities. So that was first and foremost. Then they went into the graduate schools of education. They had saturated those completely. Um, and then when you have the universities that teach undergraduates, the graduate schools of education that teach teachers who then go out and teach, you know, K through 12, you know, primary school students, secondary school students, um, you have a built in transmission belt of ideology and you have one that is totally subsidized by the state and therefore not subject to any kind of market discipline. If you're a college professor in a state university, um, you know, you're, 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 you're really buffered from any kind of uh, economic constraint or limitation or discipline. The second reason though, and this is more significant and this is really falls on the shoulders rather, rather you know, of conservatives and, and a failure of, of conservatives and institutionalists over the last 50 years. Conservatives bought into two ideas. First, that there is such a thing as institutional neutrality, that this is the goal towards which we should, we should strive as a mode of governance. And then following kind of Reagan, Thatcher ideology, 
that the government was the problem and therefore uh, we should seek to, to reduce the size of government and participation in government is somehow compromised, is somehow uh, dirty, is somehow uh, antithetical to a libertarian ideal. But what this did, the false notion of neutrality, plus the abdication and the denigration of governance, let all of the institutions and the leadership positions within public institutions in particular, uh, it left them open territory. And the center-left liberals, who may have been administrators in public universities or, 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 or even faculty department chairs in public universities, were not able to resist the very tough kind of street level tactics of those radicals and, and, and people who had participated in revolutionary movements, they ran right through these departments, mm -hmm. bowled over the, the center left liberals and conservatives have, had, had, had decamped. They had left the institutions wide open uh, under this false myth that they would somehow remain neutral. And so that sequence of events over time, and then conservatives after the Cold War thought that they had won the war against the radical left, won the war against the Marxist left, um, you know, left uh, all of our institutions totally unguarded. And so when all of a sudden you see everyone, you know, bending the knee to BLM in 2020, having done the, re the historical research, having understood how they achieved power, having understood their tactical brilliance, um, it was really uh, uh, not a question of, of, of if, but when. Uh, 2020 happened to be the inciting incident to this story, um, but there was certainly a backstory that drove it to that moment. You know, it, one of the things that I find highly comical is the left now crying out that we are waging a culture war. And I think, yeah, it's a war now because before it was just an invasion while we sat down and sort of lay down and they marched over us. But it, it does seem guys like DeSantis are fighting back in a new way. And I have to, you know, I have to give credit to, to Donald Trump as well for sort of opening up and being too uh, unchanged to basically even, I don't even think he knew what he was walking into when he did it. Um, but it is, it is a big change. I, talk a little bit about this guy, uh, Marcuse. Marcuse, is that how it's pronounced? Because I, I remember when I was 18 years old and a liberal, a guy explaining Marcuse to me and, and, and saying, that sounds like insane. And it also sounds like fascist. Who was this guy and what did he believe? Because he's kind of at the heart of the whole thing. He, he really is. You know, Marcuse was a, 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 a German-American philosopher. He uh, fled uh, the, the Nazis in the 1930s, came to the United States. Um, you know, he's part of the famed uh, Frankfurt School. Um, and so he was a, a leading figure many decades later. Um, in the 1960s, he became this guru of the student radical movement and, uh, and, and the personal mentor and doctoral advisor to Angela Davis, who became the most famous black radical, you know, Communist Party USA member um, uh, in the United States. Uh, and so he was at the heart of this. And, all, and he had these uh, students who really flocked to him as this sage. And he was a brilliant man. He was a scholar of Hegel and Kant and Marx and, uh, and the European tradition, of course, on, on, on the left. Um, and what he did was, was quite, quite interesting. He legitimized and rationalized and provided an intellectual uh, argument for the impulses of the student radicals and the impulses of, the, uh, of the, the underclass in the inner cities that was starting to riot in the 1960s and, and express their, 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 their political will uh, through, through violence, uh, through looting, violence, arson, destruction. And he saw this as a new proletariat. He said that the working class in America was anti-revolutionary. It would never be a Marxian proletariat movement. It was satisfied with the washing machine, with the you know, Ford car, with the white picket f fence around the, the suburban house, um, and that it had been you know, permanently put to sleep uh, by the capitalist system. And he said what we have is a new revolutionary proletariat, the white intelligentsia and the black underclass. That became the new revolutionary subject for him. And so... The ideas that he espoused at the time were the new revolutionary subject, the repression of conservative ideas within academia, um, and then the, legitima the legitimation of uh, revolutionary violence against the state. And then, of course, the long march through the institutions, which he developed with a German student radical. And so those four key concepts generated by Marcuse all between 1968 and 1972 in my mind, are still the driving heart of left-wing ideology and left-wing politics today. You can't understand the modern left without understanding Marcuse. And then, of course, if you look at his relationship with Angela Davis, the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, 
um, you can see his influence even in BLM. And so um, to me, understanding Marcuse is understanding the modern left in a more profound way. Well, to that end, can you explain a little bit, because this was the thing that stopped me when, as an 18-year-old of listening to these ideas, how he rationalized taking away free speech. You know, how, how do you talk to Americans about what is essentially the entire basis of our country and, and convince them? What was his argument? His argument, it's, I mean, it's a sophisticated, I mean, it's a wrong argument, but it's a sophisticated argument. And so his, his, his basic idea is that um, if you want to have a truly tolerant society, you need to be intolerant towards those who would uh, have a regime of intolerance. And so kind of by corollary argument, by the same principles, you know, he said that we don't have free speech in the United States because the, the corporate media, the establishment, um, the politicians, the military generals, the military industrial complex um, had, had, had created a system that has the illusion of free speech, but really rigorously and systematically suppresses any radical and left-wing ideas. Um, kind of ironic to say that in 1968, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but still, that was his idea. And so therefore he said, in order to have true liberation, in order to have true free speech, which always leads towards left-wing uh, ideas and a left-wing conception of society, um, regrettably maybe um, we must suppress um, any kind of conservative establishment, reactionary or fascist ideas within our institutions. And so he said that he wanted a platonic dictatorship of the intellectuals uh, um, more than he would want the existing dictatorship of generals, politicians, and the, then the kind of public majority. That was his, if he said, if I have a trade-off between these two, I want the dictatorship of the platonic and, and, and theoretically left-wing intellectuals. And actually a journalist asked him in the late 70s, as he was an elderly person, um, who died just a few years later, said, you know, you've been, you've been criticized for this, anti-free speech, anti-First Amendment, suppressed conservatives, but the journalist was trying to give him a, 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 a fair reading or a charitable reading and said, but you don't really mean that, right? So a, a conservative professor who uh, advocates for free markets, who advocates against the welfare state programs, certainly you wouldn't want to suppress or, or eject or banish this person from the university. And Marcuse says, oh, no, no, yes, that kind of, that kind of, uh, that kind of research in the university should not be tolerated, should not be allowed. That person should be, you know, booted from the institution. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, the, the, you know he, was, he was, you know, pointing, uh, you know, fascism at others. Um, but, you know, his ideas, you know, when, you, when you actually think about how they would be implemented, um, resemble something, something that is certainly, I think, fair to describe as authoritarian. Did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Of course you did. Look at me. Look at me. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance in our days. Having a consistent nighttime routine is non-negotiable. If you're struggling with sleep, you need to check out Beam. Beam's top-selling Beam Dream has a new formula. Dream contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, and apigenin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and help you wake up refreshed. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. I checked out all of those ingredients, and they all do help you sleep. And today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's delicious Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa and chocolate peanut butter, Better Sleep has never tasted better. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shop B-E-A-M dot com slash Claven and use code Claven for up to 40% off. Everybody can spell beam. How do you spell Claven? K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no easy The book is America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything by Christopher F. Rufo. Really entertaining and really helpful to understanding what's going on right in this moment. Why, when the Soviet Union collapsed, did this not put a bug in anybody's ear? Did not? Did nobody in this group say, "Hmm, you know, maybe maybe that didn't work out too well"? Or was the idea, the old idea, like, "Oh yeah, but they didn't. It wasn't real socialism or something like that." It, yeah, it, the, the, unfortunately, the latter, and, and that's one of the interesting things that that I that I saw in my research. Then, in the biographical portraits of these four figures that were, you know, diehard left wing Marxist radicals. You know, they, they rationalize, they rationalize, they rationalize, even in the face of the evidence. So 
you know, one of the characters, Paulo Freire, who's the most important education theorist in, in the United States, unfortunately, um, in the 1980s, was still saying that Chairman Mao's cultural revolution was, quote, the most genial solution of the century. Um, after the bodies had been counted, after the devastation uh, had been documented, after the starvation uh, from Mao's, uh, uh, you know, re regime over the over the preceding decades had been incontrovertibly incontrovertibly proved proven. He still said, "Ah, no, fundamentally, you know, he was right." And so Derek Bell, the Godfather of Critical Race Theory, in the final section of the book, you know, he says that America is fundamentally racist. Uh, all of our institutions are racist. Abraham Lincoln's a racist. The Fourteenth Amendment's racist. Civil Rights Act is racist. Brown versus Board of Education is racist. It's a rotten, cynical society that is uh, that can and racism can never be eradicated because it is it is at the core of the American experience. Well, his mentee, uh, while he was a you know a professor at Harvard Law, a guy named Barack Obama, mm. becomes president. And Derek Bell, in his old age, in 2012 or uh, or 2010 or 2012, something along there, is interviewed, and they say, "Well, you know, Professor Bell, you've been so negative about race in America. You say that it's white supremacist, that there's no such thing as racial progress." Your student, your mentee, Barack Obama, is now president. How do you explain that? And he says, you know, Barack Obama is, I can't remember the exact phrase, to paraphrase, it, he's, is a, a black face of a white supremacist country. <laughs> Nothing has changed. It's, it's, not, it's not gotten any, any better. Progress is impossible. And so the, 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 the core movement of the left, the core, the core historical pattern is idealism to cynicism. I mean, that's what you see over and over and over because the ideas start, start, start with a utopian fantasy. Uh, the, the, the midpoint is a kind of practical consequences of these ideas, which is disaster. And then they adopt this really cynical, pessimistic, even nihilistic posture at the end. Hmm. Um, and then the cycle, the cycle continues. But nihilism is easier than saying I was wrong. I mean, there's the one, the hard, one of the hardest things for human beings to utter is the words I was wrong. So at the end of this, you sound a note of hope. But it's interest, it was interesting to me that your hopefulness was based on the human spirit. It wasn't actually a program, or am I misreading this? I mean, you don't, do you have, it, it, when people say, I mean, people are very uh, dispirited. You know, they very much feel like we're being overwhelmed. We have a Department of Justice that acts unjustly. We have a, a president that, who is uh, utterly corrupt. We have a press that doesn't report the truth. And, and we watched our cities burn while people stood in front of burning buildings saying this demonstration is mostly peaceful, and you sort of think like, oh, I'm in, I've gone into Wonderland. What do you think we should do? And, and, and I mean each of us. I mean each person who wants to bring America back to the celebration of individual freedom. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm optimistic fundamentally, and I think that um, what, what we see right now is a profound disconnect between uh, our, our democratic structure uh, and the wishes of, of the people um, and the governance and the ideology of our institutions. And so um, we have to figure out a way to get these, these, these two phenomena in, in alignment again. And, and look, I, I, I trust uh, the average American citizen still. I'm optimistic about the average American citizen. I, I think that if we uh, put more faith in the intuitions of the average person in this country, we'd have a much better country than if we put our faith in the intuitions of the kind of intellectual class uh, uh, that, that, that pushes around, you know, CRT, et cetera. Um, but what, what I really think we need in this country more than anything is a reinvigoration of our republic and for our citizens and for our legislators to rediscover that there is a, there is a profoundly important task for them it's not merely to win elections or to talk on television uh, or to, to you know, solicit uh, donor dollars, but it's actually to govern on behalf of the people who elect them. And I think Republican legislators, let's say even in conservative states, abdicated that responsibility for a long, long time. They let left-wing ideologues take over their universities, take over their K-12 schools, take over their state bureaucracies. And they have essentially, they govern institutions that oppose them, that, that despise their values, that seek to undermine them. And so what we need is to, to reinvigorate the democratic process and have legislators that are go and are going to retake institutions, reform institutions, abolish institutions as necessary, and make sure that all public institutions are, are, are oriented towards the public interest 
that reflect the values of the public and will advance uh, uh, the, the, the spirit uh, of, of our constitution, of our declaration, of the, of the best uh, version uh, of, of how people think, how they feel, how they want to raise their kids, what they want to transmit to the next generation. And so I think that the, de the democracy problem that we have is the critical one. But the good news is that the legislators write all the rules. If the legislators in Oklahoma, for example, to take one state, did not want DEI in any of their schools or any of their public universities, they could write a three paragraph bill, pass it through their super majorities in the legislature, get it on the governor's desk, sign it, and they're gone the next day. We have the power, the people, to elect legislators to, to reshape a, a public life. Um, uh, but, but we have to have the courage to do it. We have to have the intelligence to do it. And I, so I tell people who, 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 who bring up the issues that you raise, oh, it's hopeless, we have this, that, and the other thing. The greatest limitation for conservatives is self-limitation. The left is, is nothing compared to that. We have everything that we need still intact to, to reshape public life towards the good. Uh, and it, it's only the limitations that we have inside and as a movement, as a political force, um, that, that those are the only things that we should really focus on. Those are the only things that ultimately that we need to, to overcome in order to prevail. Uh, it's a really excellent point, and I have noticed this and talked about this, the, the way that concern, I mean, despair is one of the worst. It's, it's not only, it's not only uh, unbiblical, it's also an incredibly bad strategy. It's just a, it's, the, it's the worst political strategy there is. So you write this book, America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Anybody invite you on their mainstream uh, newscasts? Uh, any left-wing people asked to talk to you? Things are changing. You know, a year ago, two years ago, I think the answer would have been 100% no. And now the answer is maybe just 75% no. <laughs> uh, so I was able to do some left-wing podcasts, small magazines, uh, you know, The Intercept, some, some other things that are on the left, but, uh, you know, a bit smaller. Um, uh, I, I did not get any invitations, despite my publicist uh, for the, you know, for HarperCollins reaching out on, on NPR, CNN, MSNBC, um, you know, uh, NP, whatever, whatever, the other, the other kind of big ones. Uh, but there was actually one unexpected, uh, uh, kind of surprising, maybe bright spot in a bit more dialogue. Um, I had a, 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 an op-ed I wrote, you know, kind of based on some of the work I've been doing that highlighted in the book, um, actually get accepted and published in the New York Times, mm. uh, which I don't think would have happened a couple years ago. Uh, when you know Tom Cotton famously published an op-ed and, and everyone got fired and, and it was a <laughs> it was a whole scandal and it was a big problem, they tried you know the, the left wing activists tried to do that uh, you know last week when the Times published my op-ed, they didn't get much traction, they didn't get much energy, that they didn't have any fear uh, in, in the editorial room in the in the New York Times, and so I think and I hope that things are changing. I hope we can engage in a bit more of an exchange, a dialogue with some of our interlocutors, but. Um, while that's fun, while I enjoy it, while I think there's a theatrical benefit to it and perhaps a kind of public intellectual benefit to it, to that kind of, uh, that kind of exchange, my focus is still, you got to write, um, you got to reach your audience, you got to reach your people, you've got to change the minds of legislators who are already predisposed um, to, 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 to advancing your ideas. Um, and, and ultimately, that's, that's the real work. And so it's fun to chat on the kind of left-wing podcast for sure. Um, but I'm not under any illusion that the real task ahead of us is really an internal task for our folks to get out there and make those incremental changes. Really smart stuff. Chris, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming on. The book, again, is America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Good luck with it. Uh, you deserve it. And uh, next time you're in my neighborhood, uh, buy me a drink. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. And great to see you.